I wanted to, um, you know, each year I'd do this as, as, the, as our anniversary rolls around. I want to know the significance of the number of years associated. And so uh, I looked up the meaning of the number 13. And I want to share some of this with you before I say what I have to say about the Torah portion. <clears throat> and uh, this is from a Jewish perspective. In, unfortunately, in Christianity, because of the, the introduction of uh, pagan elements, um, 13 became a superstitious number that was considered to be bad. And even amongst, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you may know Christian people who believe that the number 13 is bad. And when Friday the 13th comes around, people talk about how bad a day that is, and et cetera, et cetera. But in Jewish belief, 13 is not a bad number. It's, in fact, not only is it not a bad number, it is almost the ultimately good number. And here's why. <clears throat> According to the scriptures, God exhibits 13 attributes of mercy. Okay? And he, in the scriptures, reveals those attributes of mercy to us. Now, you know, if, if you go very far into Judaism, then you end up being introduced to uh, Kabbalah at some point in time, and they get very, very mystic uh, in regards to the 13 attributes. And I, I don't have any desire to do that. There's no reason to do that. Just be aware that the attributes of mercy of our God are 13. Another interesting thing about the number 13 is that in mathematics it is known as the maximal, the number of maximal differentiation. The reason why it's given this term is because it takes 12 lines to form a cube or a, sp a space, okay? And number 13 is that element that holds the 12 together. Okay? It is what is in the center of the 12. In fact, the 12 are all connected to the 13. So 13 is the number that bonds multiplicity into oneness. For example, there are 12 tribes of Israel that are bound together by their father, Israel, or Yaakov. There are 12 Talmidim, 12 disciples, bound together by Yeshua, who is number 13. Even the words that describe, some of the words that describe God and um, if you're at all familiar with gematria, gematria is taking the numerical value of the Hebrew letters and adding it together to find the numerical weight of a, a given word. And because our God is a mathematical God, His mathematics and His numbers show up everywhere. And so, I don't want, again, I don't want to get too deep into that and too mystic when it comes to that. 
but there is significance in the numbers. Now, it used to be that in Hebrew, you counted by with the alphabet, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, etc. Now they have developed a total, totally separate counting system in Hebrew. Achat, Shtaim, Shalosh, Arba, Chamesh, Sheh, Sheva, etc. Okay? Totally separate from the letters. Okay? But it used to be that they used the Hebrew letters as numbers as well, and they assigned each of the letters a numeric value. And so those numeric values have come through history to today, and it's used to take a look at um, the numeric weight of certain words in the Scripture. yod heh vav -He, being that it is the only, and I shared with you guys, it is the only Hebrew word that cannot be broken down into a three root, three word, a three letter root. It exists as a four letter base. You can't break it down any more than that. Its numeric value is 26, which is twice 13. Okay? The word Echad, which describes the unity of our God. The numeric weight of Echad is 13. The word in Hebrew, Ahava, which is the Hebrew word for love, the numeric weight is 13. And I could go on and on and on. So in, in Hebrew, in Jewish thinking, the number 13 is not a bad number. It's a very good number. And it's, it's, that number is associated quite extensively with our God. And so I want to remove any and all stigma that may be given to the number 13. Now what I wanted to talk to you about, oh first before I get into this, I just want to say something else about the, uh, about the decorations. Decorating, by and large, as everybody know, here knows, and I'm not saying this is exclusively across the board, but it's, by and large, a woman thing. For us guys, for the most part, we could not care less. And I've actually had women tell me, make statements to me, such as, just think of what this world would be like if you didn't have women to decorate and to make things pretty. And, of course, I, like most guys, I get a look on my face like, and, there, and the problem is? <laughs> We just, I don't know, guys are just like that. It's not that important to us. But as I come in here and I look at what my wife has done, and she has a gift for decorating, this is very beautiful. And um, I, I didn't know a lot of the stuff that's up there on the stage she purchased yesterday, last night. And so I didn't even, I didn't know that that was there or was going to be there. And um, that goes along with the That goes along with the mezuzah. And so I presume you're not a Christmas expert. 
Uh, yeah, what you said. Fear of the number 13. Oh, no. No, I have no fear of the number 13. All right. <clears throat> the 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 parsha acharimot begins with these words. Uh, Vayikra Leviticus chapter sixteen verse one. Adonai spoke with Moshe after the death of Aharon's two sons when they tried to sacrifice before Adonai and died. Adonai said to Moshe, Tell your brother Aharon not to come at just any time into the holy place beyond the curtain in front of the ark cover which is on the ark so that he will not die because I appear in the cloud over the ark cover. Here is how Aharon is to enter the holy place. With a young bull as a sin offering and, as a, and a ram as a burnt offering, he is to put on the holy linen tunic, have the linen shorts next to his bare flesh, have the linen sash wrapped around him, and be wearing the linen turban. They are the holy garments. He is to bathe his body in water and put them on. He is to take from the community of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aharon is to present the bull for the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and his household. He is to take the two goats and place them before Adonai at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then Aharon is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Adonai and the other for Azazel. Aharon is to present the goat whose lot fell to Adonai and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat whose lot fell to Azazel is to be presented alive to Adonai to be used for making atonement over it by sending it away into the desert for Azazel. Aharon is to present the bull of the sin offering for himself. He will make atonement for himself and his household. He is to slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before Adonai, and with his hands full of ground, fragrant incense, bring it inside the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before Adonai, so that the cloud from the incense will cover the ark cover which is over the testimony in order that he not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the ark cover toward the east. And in front of the ark cover he is to sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Next he is to slaughter the goat of the sin offering which is for the people bring its blood inside the curtain and do with its blood as he did with the bull's blood, sprinkling it on the ark cover and in front of the ark cover. He will make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And he is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is there with them right in the middle of their uncleannesses. No one is to be present in the tent of meeting from the time he enters the holy place to make atonement until the time he comes out, having made atonement for himself, for his household, and for the entire community of Israel. Then he is to go out to the altar that is before Adonai and make atonement for it. He is to take some of the blood, bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, thus purifying it and setting it apart from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. When he has finished atoning for the holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he is to present the live goat. Aharon is to lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the transgressions, crimes, and sins of the people of Israel. 
is to put them on the head of the goat and then send it away into the desert with a man appointed for the purpose. The goat will bear all their transgressions away to some isolated place and he is to let the goat go in the desert. Aharon is to go back into the tent of meeting where he is to remove the linen garments he put on when he entered the holy place and he is to leave them there. Then he is to bathe his body in water in a holy place, put on his other clothes, come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, thus making atonement for himself and for the people. He is to make the fat of the sin offering go up in smoke on the altar. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Aharon, or the high priest, was only allowed, as you know, to come in to the Holy of Holies once a year. And when he did, he had to go through this big, long process in order to do it. And part of that process required that he take a censer full of hot coals and put incense on it to create a cloud of smoke in the Holy of Holies so that he would not die. Now the incense, you might be thinking the incense was for a sweet fragrance for the Lord. Well, it did smell good. But really the purpose for the incense was to create a cloud to obscure the view of the Shekinah that rested on the top of the Aron Kodesh. Because if the high priest saw the Shekinah in full view without any, anything obscuring his view, the very glory of the Shekinah would kill him. Okay? <coughs> the reason I bring all of this up, because there's actually several different places in this passage, if you note, where it says that he must do this or he will die. He must do that or he will die. Okay? It was a very fearful thing for the high priest to come into the presence of the Shekinah, the glory of God. And although there is no occasion that the people of Israel can have recorded of a high priest dying because he went into the Holy of Holies unworthily. It nevertheless, every time the high priest had to do that, he had to have been shaking in his boots. Because everything had to be just so in order to go in there and do what he was assigned to do. We have lost the understanding of that kind of fear of God. And we have been taught, and rightfully so, I'm not saying that the teaching is incorrect, because it actually comes from the Scripture. We have been taught that because of the death of Yeshua, the veil that separates us from the Holy, Holy of Holies has been torn, and we have free access to the Father. But unfortunately, what has happened, what has come with that, is a, an undue familiarity with God. We have, we come to God most often 
the body comes to God in a very nonchalant and flippant way. And I'm not suggesting that we need to revert to doing some kind of ritual before we come to God. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is our attitude needs to change about who God is, about His power, about who we are in comparison to Him, and the God whose presence could kill, it's, it's still the same God. Okay? But nothing about Him has changed. And I, I feel compelled to present this because I believe that a time is coming and not very far off. You know, we, we talk in very generic terms about how as we approach the end, there will be a polarization between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And yet again, I believe that we talk in, about those subjects without understanding of what we're actually saying and what actually will occur. Yes, there will be a polarization of the two kingdoms. But the nature of that polarization, I don't think most of us have even considered. We still, at this point in the history of mankind, see a great deal of overlapping and a lot of gray when it comes to the manifestation of the two kingdoms. But as we approach the end, when the man of sin, according, according to what the scripture calls him, when the man of sin is revealed, there will be such a radical shift that you cannot imagine. Evil will become so terribly evil that it will be beyond your comprehension today. You will not know that evil until you see it. And all of the things that you could imagine and maybe have memories of in your family of things like the Holocaust or all of the people that Stalin killed the various leaders of countries who have caused mass genocide of people groups in their country, all of that will pale in comparison. We are beginning, I think, to see some manifestation of that in And I know what I'm about to say is going to be extremely controversial for some. Especially for some who watch the YouTube video. But we are beginning to see the tip of the iceberg in Islam. I don't know how many of you have seen the video and I'm not recommending that you see it but I have seen it of the beheading of a, of a young man who was Muslim and converted to Christianity and I want to tell you beheading by Muslims is not what you think they do not put your head on a chopping block and in one blow take your head off. That would be humane. That would be merciful. That would be instant. 
Instead, they take a knife about the size of a butcher knife and they start at the front and saw your neck off. It is the most inhumane thing I have ever seen. That is just the tip of the iceberg. And the whole time that they were doing it to this man, they were praising Allah. It is the epitome of evil. But I don't want to leave us on that note. Instead, I want to talk about what's going to happen on the kingdom of light side. Okay? For many, many years as I grew up, I would hear people talk about the desire to return to the days of the first church, the book of Acts. And I've actually heard different congregations describe themselves as a, an Acts 15 church or whatever. And when I hear that, I'm like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You don't. Number one, we don't want to return to Acts 15. Okay? That was just the beginning. What God wants for us as a body so far surpasses what we read about in the book of Acts that again you cannot imagine what it is that he wants. What is in store for us? What will happen? And I personally believe that the next quote-unquote revival that will happen will not be anything like what we're seeing happening around this country and around the world where people are coming together and getting excited and getting healed and, and etc. That is not what God is wanting as far as revival for His bride. The revival that will come will be a revival of righteousness and holiness. It will be that God is so working on His people that He will form the bride that is without spot or without blemish or without wrinkle. It says that that's the bride that He's coming after. We are not that right now. Okay? So I can say with all assurance that the revival that He is going to bring on the earth is going to be in order to create that bride. And when he decides that it is time to do that, we will yet again see the Shekinah of God on, this, on the surface of this planet. And it will be just as it was back then, that if you are not in a good place with God, you run the risk of dying. We saw again the tip of the iceberg in the book of Acts, where a couple decided that they were going to sell some property and give the money to the congregation. But they withheld some for themselves. 
Now that wouldn't have been necessarily as bad if it hadn't been for the fact that they lied and said we're giving everything that we got from the sale to God. And immediately, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it was known, you are lying. And you haven't just lied to us, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And boom, they were gone. It will be that way again. The presence of God is holy. And he will not allow. I, I Personally, I don't understand, to tell you the truth, why he has let us rock on as long as he has in the condition that we're in. And the only way that we can be saved from that condition is by his personal intervention into this planet, into this scenario. My personal testimony, which I'm not going to go into, but my personal testimony is, is of a young man who is disillusioned, who is angry, who was judgmental, who didn't want to have anything to do with Christians and Christianity, who, when he went to Baruch Hashem for the first time, had no idea that God was going to do anything to him or for him. And God stepped into my life and into that situation and radically changed me in a moment of time. It was all his doing. It wasn't anything that I did. It wasn't anything that I desired even. That's the amazing thing. I didn't go, yes, I was searching for the truth. Yes, I wanted to know what it really meant to worship God, to serve God. Not like what I had been taught. Because I came to understand that what I had been taught, excuse my French, was a bunch of bunk. Okay? And I had people surrounding me for so long who would say one thing and do another that I finally came to a point where I said, this is a bunch of bunk. I can't do this. I will not be two-faced. God created me from the womb almost as an honest person, okay? I'm the kind of person, I want to know the truth, I speak the truth, I spent too many years lying. I made stories up about myself because I was not treated very well as a child. I made stories up about myself to make myself look more important than I actually was, trying to get approval from people. And I, w I weaved such a web of lies that the only way that I could be free from that was for God to come in and sever all those cords. But he did it in a moment of time without my expectation. That is what God is going to do. The scripture, we've been looking at it. In the, in the prophetic scriptures, the scripture says that the Messiah will come suddenly. He will come suddenly. So, and, and we also have the scriptures that tell us that people will be going about their lives, doing all the normal stuff that they normally do right up until the end, just like it was with Noah. And all of a sudden, boom, God appears. 
And everything changes when he appears. Every time God has stepped down out of heaven into the earth, there has been this, this chopping of time. It's like he takes an axe, time is a root, and he takes an axe and buries the axe into the root. Forever that root is changed. And so, it is important, I believe that is why Abba had us begin our existence with the Parsha Kedushim, holy people. I cannot, obviously can't say that this is the one place in the earth that God wants to start all this. I don't, I don't believe that. But what I do know is that this is a place where God wants to do that. Okay? So I can't say it's the place, but it is a place. And it's been His intention from the very beginning when we were sharing facilities with other churches and moving from place to place, when we were in the tent, now that we're in the building, those things don't affect what God desires for this group of people. But the, this is a tool that He wants to use. That's the only reason why we have it. It's a tool. Okay? God is going to do something radically amazing here. And it is going to require, because of what He is going to do, it is re going to require us to be holy people. And if we're not, you do not want to be in that place. Okay? I want to close what, I, what I'm saying with something, with a passage that I personally, that God has been speaking to me about, that I have been contemplating. And I want to bring it up to you because I want you to contemplate it as well. I want you to think about it. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to ask God what it means. What does this mean? Both in general and for you specifically. It's found in Tehillim, in Psalms chapter 24. Verses 3 through 6. Psalm 24, 3 through 6. I can't preach on this yet because I don't have a full understanding myself. It says, Who may go up to the mountain of Adonai? What does this mean? It means who can enter His presence? Who can go be in His presence? Who can stand in His holy place? Those with clean hands and pure hearts who don't make vanities the purpose of their lives or swear oaths just to deceive. Okay. They will receive a blessing from Adonai and justice from God who saves them. Such is the character of those who seek Him. 
of Yaakov who seeks your face. I want you guys in coming weeks to repeatedly look at and consider this and ask the Lord what this means. I want to hear from you if you get some kind of revelation from the Lord about what this is saying. Uh, now, I, what, I, what I want you to understand is I'm not saying I'm totally ignorant of what this is saying. What I'm saying is there is a depth to this, to what is being said here, that's not, it's not apparent on the surface when you just read, okay? And if there is some deeper revelation that the Lord gives to you in regards to this passage, I would like to know. Not now. I want you to actually don't want you to respond now. I want you to take time and pray and, and ask the Lord. Because this is our destiny, folks. This is our destiny. Clean hands, pure hearts. And so with that, I want to end and pray and, and then we'll go on with the rest of the service. Abba, I noticed that in the little uh, four-page thing that Deborah made up to be handed out, that inside are two pictures of the warrior bride. Father, you've been speaking to us about that for a long time now. And it, it's like two sides of a coin. When we think about a bride, we normally think of very soft things. When we think of a warrior, we're thinking of tough and strong. And those two things don't seem to go together, and yet that is what you're asking of us. Because as the polarization increases, as the axe comes down and makes the split, the definite split between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, where there is no gray any longer, where either you are in one camp or you're in the other, there is no in-between. When that happens, you will not only be forming a bride for yourself, but you will be coming to this earth as a conquering king, as a warrior, and your expectation is that your bride will fight along with you. Your expectation is that once you are married to your bride, your bride will share everything with you. And that even means in making war, in overcoming your enemies, even to the point of judging angels. Well, Father, like we said before, if you were to come right now, you would not find a bride that is ready for that. <sighs> 
because your word says that it's necessary for us to fulfill all obedience ourselves before we can judge someone else's obedience. And so, Father, as we look down the road toward what your goal is, Father, may we understand, may you reveal to us and put it in our heart what steps must be taken in order to reach that goal. Father, at once it is both something that you do and something that we do. It's not like we can just lay around and do nothing and expect you to come and do it all. That's not the way that you work. And so, Father, we need to know, we know that you will be faithful to do your part. You always have been faithful. But, Father, we need to know what we should be doing, what our part is to see this happen, Lord God. So when we pray, Father, make us into the bride that you say that you're coming after. We're not praying that with the expectation that you're going to do all of it. But when we pray that, we're also asking that you show us how we help you get us to that point. Father, make us into the bride without spot or wrinkle. In Yeshua's name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevaret Adonai Vayishmarecha Yair Adonai Panav Alecha Vikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.